Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, guys. Everett's out of town this week, and so I think these guys just did an absolutely great job of leading us into worship, God. Well, last week we started a new series, and we were talking about worldview. And I know I was dumping a lot of information on you, and, and it's hard to sort through all those things. So in the sermon notes this morning, uh, on the back side of those, uh, we put kind of a chart talking about the different worldviews. And so that's for you, for your use, and hopefully that can help you straighten through some things and, and stuff like that. And it's important because your worldview, how you look at the world and, and the way you observe it, man, those basic assumptions that you have, it colors everything that you look at. One of the most obvious places that this happens is in the areas of, of faith and science. You see, our country has come to trust in the, in the scriptures, in the Bible, our country has come to trust in the Bible less and less and less. And we trust in science more and more and more. And I just want to see, I want you all to see in how short a time, how far we've come. And so there's a, a video clip I want to show you. It's, it's a great example. This video is from 1953. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a movie where our planet has been invaded by aliens. <laughs> now, we tried to fight them with the military, but we failed. So... Here's, what, here's the deal. When we failed to beat the aliens, the people in the movie ran to the churches. And they prayed to God, and watch what happens next.
had no resistance to the bacteria in our atmosphere to which we have long since become immune. Once they had breathed our air, germs which no longer affect us began to kill them. The end came swiftly. All over the world, their machines began to stop and fall. After all that men could do had failed, the Martians were destroyed and humanity was saved by the littlest things which God in his wisdom had put upon this earth. Did you catch that? <laughs> when man had done everything that we could do, they were destroyed by the little things which God in his wisdom had placed there. That, to me, I mean, that so typifies the reality of our country in 1953. And I've said this before in different places, and I'll say it again. The movies of the day in the 50s, they all acknowledged that there was God. They quoted scripture so much. Even the bad guys quoted scripture in the old movies. But who was the salvation there? God in his wisdom saved mankind. Now I want you to fast forward 43 years, one generation. I want you to fast forward that. The exact same scenario, the exact same scenario. Aliens have invaded our country. We tried to fight them with the best that we can, and we failed miserably. And so this is what happened one generation later. How did you do that? I gave it a cold. I gave it a virus. Computer virus. Are you telling us you can send out a signal that will disable all their shields? That's right, just like they used our satellites against us. We can use their own signal against them. If we plant a virus into that mother ship, it's going to then filter down into all the corresponding ships below. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Just how exactly do we infect the mother ship with this virus? Well, we're going to... Uh have to um, fly their alien craft out of our atmosphere and dock with it. We can enter here, uh, as shown in the satellite photos. We then upload the virus. We then set off some kind of uh, explosion, which will disable it, and that'll disorient the smaller ships below, and that could buy it, I think, at least some time to, uh, to take, them, take them out, take them down, do your, do your stuff. See the shift there? Now, instead of God being the one that's our salvation, it's mankind and it's science that is salvation of mankind. One generation goes from the total dependence on God to the total dependence on man. And so much of the, the, the shift has come through science. See, here's the deal. Many people reject the scriptures because they believe that Christians live their lives by blind faith, while they make decisions based on science. And they think that science and faith are incompatible. But nothing could be further from the truth. True science and true faith have no conflicts. There is no contradiction between true science and true faith in the Bible. The issue is there's a lot of bad definitions of Christianity and there's a lot of bad definitions of science. So... Let's go back to the Bible and see what the Bible says and the foundations that we can have for these things. And so if you have a Bible this morning, turn to Genesis chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one of the cheers in front of you. Uh, Genesis 1 is on page 1. Um, if you have your own Bible, Genesis 1 is on page 1 there as well. So it uh, should be an easy morning for you. Genesis 1, while you're looking that up... Um, the first thing we're going to look at this morning is this. God is the foundation of operational science. God is the foundation of operational science. Operational science is this. It's, it's this thing that you learn in your textbooks in school. It talks about the scientific process. The scientific process is systematic observation. It's measurement, it's experimentation, it's testing, it's a modification of your hypothesis. That's what, scientific, the op, that's what operational science does. And modern science is made possible because of our faith in God, because of who God is, because of how he behaves, and because how he has set up the universe. All those things, those three things, are the foundation of modern science. 
Genesis 1, uh, starting with verse 3, um, here is the creation account. Just listen to this and follow along. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. And then it goes on and lists uh, the rest of creation. And as you, as you read through the rest of creation, you, you look at the order of creation. And on the first day, God formed light and darkness. And then on the fourth day, he filled that. I think we have a, a slide for that. On the first day, God formed light and darkness. And on the fourth day, he filled it with the sun, the moon, and the stars. So kind of an interesting thing. God made the light. And God is light, and later he, he made other light sources. So before the sun was even here, God was light and provided the light. But there was a separation there. Now the second day, God formed the sky and the water. And the parallel on the fifth day, he filled those things with the creatures that would inhabit them, the birds and the fish. On the third day, God formed the land. And on the sixth day, he filled it with the land animals and people. And so as you walk through the days of creation, you can see that God absolutely had a plan for creation. He proceeded in a very orderly way, a reasonable way, and a logical way. And all of science, um, operational science, it has its basis in this thought that God made the world in a, an orderly way. If I mix these two chemicals together and they blow up today... And then tomorrow, I mix these two chemicals, the exact same ones, and they just turn into ice. That's a messed up world. You can never be sure of what you're doing. You know, you may mix these two things and think that you're going to be able to drink and, and explode inside of you instead. That's, that's a crazy world. That's not the world I would want to live in. But instead, God, because of who he is and how he created the world, science is able to exist. We can observe things, we can repeat things, we can experiment with things. And Christianity teaches this about God. And it's very important because ancient cultures didn't have this basic belief system. See, Christianity teaches that the physical world, the, the things that are around us, it's real. And you're like, well, yeah, it's real. I can touch this and it's real. Well, Ancient Eastern philosophers taught that all of the world was just an illusion. You're just making this stuff up. It's just one big long dream, okay? Well, Christianity is opposed to that. Christianity teaches that nature is good. Christianity teaches that nature is good, but it's not God. There's a, there's a, there's a, a theology out there that's called pantheism. And pantheism says that God is everything. So not only does God exist, but he is me, he is you, he is that chair. Uh, if you remember the, the Disney movie Pocahontas, in the Disney movie Pocahontas, Pocahontas says that. She says every rock, every tree, every creature has a life. So she's equating, she's saying that we are equal to um, animals, and we're equal to plants, and we're equal to the rocks. Okay? Okay. Well, the Bible teaches that nature is good, but it's not divine. It's not God in those things. The Christianity teaches that humans can discover nature's order. That's the whole basis of operational science. We can discover these things. And it just makes sense. But the Chinese used to teach that you couldn't understand nature. It was way too mysterious for you to get a handle on. Christianity teaches that we need to experiment 
We need to seek to understand our universe. And God encourages us to do that. Proverbs 18.15 says this, The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge. The ears of the wise seek it out. God wants us to examine his universe, to see how these things fit together, to see how all this stuff works. He encourages that type of pursuit. And I'll tell you what, scientists have used this basic belief in God throughout history to practice their science. Probably the greatest scientist of all time was Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton had a very fundamental faith in God. And because of his faith in God, he was able to do all this science stuff and just do just amazing things. And did you know he wrote more about Christianity than he did about science? But there were plenty of Christian scientists, uh, people like Kepler and Bacon and Galileo, uh, Johannes Kepler. Johannes Kepler was looking at astronomy. He was looking at the stars and the planets. And he started tracking the planets. And he started to say, well, something's wrong. Because as I'm watching that planet out there, and it's, it's in orbit around the sun, it, it should be a circular orbit. And everyone agreed it should be a circular orbit around the sun. But when he was watching them, he was saying, but it's not exactly a circle. And people were like, well, the measurements may be a little fuzzy, and that's okay. And Kepler's like, no, no. If, if, that, if God made that planet to orbit the sun in a circle, it should be exactly a circle. But it's off. And it drove him crazy. Some of you OCD people, you could relate. Okay? And so he's up there and, and he's looking at this and finally he figured it out. The orbits of the planets are not circles. They're ellipses. And when he ran the math on that, he found that the planets orbit the sun as perfect ellipses. The exact way that God made them. Because of his belief in, in God and the way that God creates things and the way that God has an orderly mind, it helped him to come to this conclusion of saying, if God made it in a way, it's going to be exactly that way. The more we learn about our bodies, the more we will learn about this planet, the more that we learn about the universe, the more amazing is the greatness of God's design. Operational science deals with things that are observable. We can see them. Ob uh, operational science deals with things that are repeatable. We can keep doing the same experiment time after time. But operational science doesn't deal with everything. Okay? Things that have happened in the past, things that aren't repeatable, operational science is no good for those. Instead, you need a whole other branch of science, and it, it's called historical science. And faith is the foundation of historical science. Faith is the foundation. Historical science means this, interpreting evidence to explain the past. Okay, and a lot of things are based on historical science. The life of historical figures like Julius Caesar or the Apostle Paul are based on historical science. Uh, the writings of people like Aristotle or the biographies about Jesus Christ, those are based on historical science. The study of ancient civilizations like the Babylonians or the Philistines are based on historical science. The study of ancient living creatures like T-Rex or Leviathan from the Bible, those are based on historical science. As Christians, we have faith in historical science. We have faith in the people who saw Jesus, people like Peter. Here's what Peter says about Jesus. In, in 2 Peter 1.16, he says this. Peter says, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter said, hey, there's a lot of stories going around about Jesus and a lot of myths and stuff like that. We didn't follow those stories. We were eyewitnesses of the majesty of Jesus Christ. We were there. We saw him. See, Peter, Peter was there. He was present when Jesus did these things. And Peter was consistent in his story. One of the, the big things about eyewitnesses is, does their story change over time? And when you read about Peter, you see that his story doesn't change. Even when he gets to the end of his life, and he, they're putting him to death, and they're crucifying him, and he says, I'm not worthy to be crucified. I want to be crucified upside down. If you made up a story, 
Not that any of us have ever done that to our parents or anyone else. But if you make up a story and they're saying, okay, um, either change your story and tell me the truth or I'm going to put you to death. You go, okay, well, no, it's still, I still believe this. Okay, and then they start nailing you to a cross. At some point, if it's a lie, you say, wait, 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 time out, time out. I made it up, made it up. Peter never did that. For his entire life, to the place that he died, he never said, you know what, I was just making that Jesus stuff up. When you look at the apostles in their lives, they were put to death. All the apostles, the 12 apostles, were put to death for their faith, except for John. And all of them, not a single one of them, recanted and said, we were just kidding. We just made up that resurrection thing. Peter was an eyewitness, and his testimony was consistent because he was there. He saw these things. Luke, Luke wasn't there. But there were so many stories circulating about Jesus. He went and talked to the people who were there. In Luke chapter 1, verse 2, he says, just as these stories, as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Peter says, or Luke says, I wasn't there, but the eyewitness accounts, the people that I've talked to that were there, they're consistent. And they handed down to us their eyewitness testimonies. And I'll tell you what, Luke's gospel, the book of Luke, and his second book, the book of Acts, the, the history of the church, are some of the most reliable ancient sources of archaeology. Even people who aren't Christians trust in the reliability of Luke's gospels. Because when he says that this city was here or this person was here, they go back in history and they dig this stuff up, and sure enough, it's exactly like Luke said. Christians operate by faith based on the evidence that's available. And you know what? So do evolutionary scientists. Evolutionary scientists work on faith based on the evidence that's available. They believe in evolution because of their faith, not because of historical, uh, not because of operational science. Because when you talk about evolution happening over billions of years, guess what the problem is? No one was there. There are no people that were there to observe those things, and video cameras hadn't been invented. And so if no one was there, we don't have any video evidence of it, then at some point they've got to use historical science because operational science can't repeat origins. It can't repeat the creation. And so they have to use historical evidence. Uh, and they have to use historical science. And here's the deal. They operate by faith based on the evidence of, that's available. One of the great uh, fundamental premises of evolution, one of the great th uh, parts that says evolution is true, is one of the ideas that you may remember studying in school. Uh, it's called uh, homogenous uh, limbs. If you remember in your science textbooks, it looks at the similarities in the limbs of different creatures, like humans and cats and whales and bats. And as you're looking through those, you see that they all have a bone, kind of like a humerus. They all have kind of a radius and an ulna. They have carpals. All, all the bones, they're different because they've evolved in different ways, but they're the same basic bones. And so evolutionists will look at that homogenous structures and say, this is proof. This is absolutely proof that these, all these animals came from a common ancestor. And you look at those and you're like, dang, you know, there are a lot of similarities there. That's amazing how, uh, yeah, I can absolutely see how those things could have evolved from the same thing. And they have faith that that's what happened. But it never, ever occurs to them that there may be another story. See, what they're doing is they're confusing the evidence with their story. The evidence is there. We can all look at the bones of creatures and say, oh yeah, they're similar. similar but does that mean that they ancestor, have a sister? Or does it mean that they have a similar designer? Maybe God, in his infinite wisdom, realized that the bone structures, that this was a good design. And he used a similar design in different creatures because it works. And so the evidence is similar structures. How you interpret that evidence depends on your worldview. Do you see how the worldview comes in? Either the, the evidence is there. Either there's a common ancestor or there's a common designer. 
it's all about how you interpret it. And evolutionists have faith in their interpretation because they start with the position that there is no God. Another place that this shows up is uh, with fossils. You know, these creatures, uh, these animals that are buried in, in layers of dirt and stuff like that. And evolutionists would look at those fossils and say, okay, well, how far, we, we need to figure out how old these things are. So if I go out and observe in the world today, um, if I look at dirt and, and how quickly it gathers to form, uh, you know, like say this many inches of soil, then I could go through the timeline and, and extrapolate from that how deep those things are buried, how long it would have taken to bury those, and that's where they come up with millions of years because they say um, things just keep going. If dirt accumulates this much over this amount of time, then boom, this is how long it would take because things have always gone on the same. A creationist would look at those exact same things and say, you know what, here's the deal. There are fossils, they're buried in the ground, absolutely. But I think that those fossils got there in a different way. I don't think it was millions of years of dirt piling up on them. I think that something happened, some catastrophe happened. I think some, some huge thing that totally changed the landscape and buried those creatures. Uh, for a, a Bible believer person, that would be the flood. Because when Noah's flood happened, we think that Noah's flood it, it was for 40 days and 40 nights. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Noah and his family were in the ark for a year and 10 days. Now, if you have water that covers the mountains of this earth and is there for a year and it's shifting and doing its thing, it's probably going to change the landscape just a little bit. But here's the difference. We have the evidence, fossils buried. We have the evolutionists who believe in uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is a big word to say that the processes of nature have stayed the same from right now all the way back to creation. That's their basic foundational belief. Creationists believe that the earth, um, that fossils are there, but that the earth had some type of catastrophe. And that catastrophe changed the landscape. But evolutionists refuse to believe in the catastrophe theory. And it's so ironic. It's ironic because it's exactly what Peter said was going to happen. 2,000 years ago, Peter wrote in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 5, Peter says, They deliberately forget... That long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed, the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Peter writes and says, in the end times, here's what's going to happen. People are going to say that everything just goes on the same that it always has. And they are going to deliberately forget Noah's flood. The first time I read that, I was like, what? What? I had to check, I had to check two or three Bibles because that can't be in there. But we live in the time, in these last times that Peter's talking about. Because up until Darwin in the late 1800s, the, the one thing that was taught was the earth was about six to 10,000 years old. The thing that was taught everywhere was that Noah, uh, flood, during the time of Noah, it flooded the earth. And it's only been since the late 1800s that these new theories have come into being. And it's like, oh my goodness, we're living in those times where people deliberately forget of the flood. They say that things have always gone on the same. You see, historical science is based on faith. The evidence is there but it's how you interpret the evidence. Did, is it something that happened over millions of years because of uniformitarianism, or is it something that happened in a short amount of time because of a catastrophe? Creationists and evolutionists both have faith in their stories. And so what happens is people live by faith. People live by faith. As Christians, we do. 2 Corinthians 5.7 says this, we live by faith, not by sight. We can't see God. We can't see him. But we can see evidence of him working. 
We have faith that he exists. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Being sure of what we hope for. Does that sound like blind faith to you? No. We're sure of what we hope for. We're certain of the things we don't see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Do you understand what that's saying there? It's saying that we, because of our faith in God, we believe that this universe came from nothing. That God spoke the material of this universe into existence. We understand that God commanded, and all the stuff that wasn't seen, it wasn't visible, now it's material. And that's exactly the opposite of the teaching of evolution. We have faith that God exists. We live by faith. Absolutely. We are not afraid to admit it. The difference is the evolutionist, evolutionary scientist, they live by faith too. <laughs> they just don't call it faith. But they, uh, you know, uh, the problem is this. We think that scientists, we picture them standing in their labs with their white lab coats on, just doing science. And they're objective, and they're just, they're following the data. Wherever the data leads them, that's the conclusion they get to. That's our picture of these perfect scientists. And I'll tell you what, it's not the reality. Because scientists are biased. They are biased to their worldview. Uh, Dr. Scott Todd from Kansas State University, here's what he said. He said, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer... Such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. Keep that quote up there. Do you see what he, naturalistic means? No God. Okay? That's what they say. When, the, when they're talking about naturalistic, they're saying there isn't a God. And so what he says is this. If all of the data that we come up with if all of the information, all the evidence, if all of the evidence points to the fact that there is a designer of this universe, then we throw it out. Why? Because it doesn't fit our story. It doesn't fit our story that there is no God. We can give them all the proof in the world, and it doesn't matter because they've already got it in their heads. There is no God. That's not objective. Scientists, go ahead. Scientists are biased. Scientists, scientists are greedy. Did you see this article recently? In the 1960s, heart disease was being studied. And the sugar industry funded research that downplayed the risks of sugar in relation to heart disease, and it increased the hazards of fat with heart disease. And what do we believe now? What causes heart disease? Bad fat, bad cholesterol. Do we think about sugar and heart disease at all? No way. Because scientists were greedy. They were being paid to come up with certain conclusions so that the sugar industry could keep selling the sugar. And it's working. We believe them. Scientists lie. Scientists lie. One of the, the very foundational, fundamental proofs of evolution is Hackle. He, he did this study on, embryo, on embryos. And he, he, because of his worldview of there is no God, evolution, he went through and he said, wow, well, well, let me look at embryos. And so he started looking at embryos of different creatures. And he said, you know, it, since we all came from a common ancestor, at our earliest form, uh, we probably look the same. I remember studying this in, in high school biology. And he's saying, and so he started, he drew pictures of all the different, of all these different animals coming from their embryonic stage and growing to the different animals they became. And you have things like chickens and, and uh, people and uh, rabbits and all kinds of things, salamanders, different things. And you look at those embryos and you're like, oh my gosh, he's right. He's right. They, those embryos at that stage of development, they all look, maybe we do come from a common ancestor. The problem is he made them up. Those drawings he cheated on. He lied on those drawings. The, the next slide shows us more of what it actually looks like. See, number one, the bottom of the, 
of that hourglass there shows the different cells. It shows them in the middle stages, and it shows them at the end. And the similarities between what they are and what they were are nowhere near what Hackle tried to make us believe. Scientists lie. And then ultimately, scientists make assumptions based on their faith. Charles Darwin takes this three-year journey, and he goes out there and he makes observations. Absolutely, that's very scientific. He combines that with the scientific principle of natural selection. Very scientific. But he mixed it with his belief in uniformitarianism. So he mixed his science with his faith because he had to figure out some way for people to have come from single-celled animals. And Darwin's theory of evolution is based on part science and part faith. Belief in a mindset, in a worldview of uniformitarianism. The problem is, Darwin had never ever seen creation happen. He had never seen creation repeated. He had never seen one species of creature change to another species of creature. He, there is no fossil record in the history of fossils that show a transitional creature from a fish to a mammal. And that Darwin himself is one, is one that said, we're stuck in this theory until we find those transitional fossils. We've never found any, because there aren't. The final evidence that we really look at is, is creation. Creation and people. And when you look at it, there's, there's two stories about how we got here. Either we are the product of chance and randomness over billions of years, or we were designed and created by an all-powerful, all-loving God. Your worldview there is so important because if you believe we're the products of chance, it really doesn't matter what we do on this planet. It doesn't matter because when you die, you're done. Who cares? But if you believe that we are God's creation, then it very much matters what you do and who you follow. Because when you die on this earth, that's just the beginning of a whole new life for eternity. And so it very much matters what you do, what you believe, and how you act. Peter said it like this in 2 Peter 3, uh, verse 9. Um, <clears throat> the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why doesn't God just come back and just finish it all off? Because he is waiting for people to come to him. And in our world today, <laughs> there is more and more people that need to come to repentance and come to a relationship with Jesus Christ. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Peter says, here's what's going to happen. Peter says, hey, I told you, I told you in the end times that people are, are going to believe in uniformitarianism. Things just keep going the same, and they're going to ignore the flood during Noah's times. They're going to ignore these things. Well, I want to tell you something else. When Jesus comes back, the whole place is being destroyed by fire. It's going to be remade. Just letting you know that it's coming. Since everything is going to be destroyed in this way, here's the kicker. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, people need to see it. Man, I'm going to be talking about politics in a few weeks, and I'll tell you what, people desperately need to see people in the church living holy and godly lives. Because we can blame whatever we want to but it's the responsibility of the people in the church to live holy and godly lives so that the people outside of God go, wow, there's something different about you, and I need to have a part of that. And if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and today, right now, is a time where you say, you know what? <laughs> this place is going to be destroyed. I want to be ready. God, me and you, <laughs> let's spend some time together and get things right. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, Man, I would love to have a conversation with you. Don't leave this place today until you sit down and talk with me or whoever it was that invited you about your walk with God. I know I presented a ton of stuff in here about all the science and stuff. 
I'd love to have a conversation with you about why we have this faith in Christ. What a difference he can make in your life. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you're the foundation for science, that our faith in you gives us the, the foundation for historical science, because you were there. You observed these things happening because you made them happen. And God, help us to see the world through your eyes, through the eyes that you, that you exist and that you love us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Please stand with us.